right. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. We're going to be starting just a second here. Um, we have all of our panelists ready now, and our attendees are joining us right now. Without further ado, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, we are really excited to bring um, another webinar from uh, PrimeView. Uh, this particular um, panel that we have here today is unique from an esports perspective. Um, we have you know people on the panel here that are from the architectural standpoint, uh, the end user side of things, um, as well as integration side, as well as obviously MEP and engineering. So thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, the topic here. Pro tips on how to plan, design, integrate, and monetize facilities for esports. So we're really excited about the topic. I think everybody here in the audience is going to want to pay attention throughout. Um, you're going to hear um, different members of the panel that give a really different perspective on where esports is going and mainly what that entails from high school, collegiate to pro, and how that really applies to the technology aspects as well as obviously monetization as you design these existing or perhaps new facilities as well. So just a um, quick forum as it relates to the structure, um, I'm gonna be, uh, we're gonna have different questions that we put together. And then obviously in the audience, if you have any questions, uh, feel free at any point to uh, give points in the comments and uh, address specific panelists or all the panelists. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback and we want this to be as engaging as possible. So please feel free to give your remarks. Um, as a brief intro, uh, we have on the panel, um, we're going to start uh, with Adrian. Adrian, Adrian why don't you give everybody a quick wave so they know who you are? Great Thank up you. Here. Adrian. Thank you. Um, so Adrian, I've known this guy for quite some time, um, a senior account manager at IVCI. Uh, they are a nationwide AV and workplace collaboration technology integration firm. Adrian has 18 years of experience in supporting clients in corporate healthcare education and related industries is a very unique approach and on establishing a long-term partnership value and ensure successful completion of client initiatives. Uh, he resides just north of New York City. Adrian enjoys spending time outdoors with his wife, children, hiking, gardening, and relaxing at the beach. Obviously not in New York though. Um, next, I'd love to introduce uh, Brandon. Give a quick wave if you don't mind so people know who you are. Brandon also has the coolest mic here on the panel. Um, Brandon um, is a member of the special project group. Brandon has over a decade of valuable um, large project team experience. At AVISPL, his, responsi his responsibilities include system design, engineering, management experience, as well as audio systems, video systems, public address intercom systems, control systems, crush on AMX, and lighting. Um, I want to give a special thank you, Brandon, for joining us. Thank you. Next on the lineup, we have Jeff uh, from O Sports. Jeff, give a quick wave. We actually had two Jeffs today, so we're very special to have you both with us. Um, so Jeff from O Sports, he's the Director of Sports and Entertainment Technology. Uh, his primary responsibility is to plan, develop, and manage the designs of projects more closely with the client, future users, and the supporting design team. Um, really happy to have you, Jeff, with the team. Thank you. Um, as well as another Florida resident, right? Can't go wrong with that. Um, um, also, I'll go to the next Jeff, spelled with a J, not a G. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much. Give a quick wave so people know who you are. Thank you. Um, had the pleasure of working for Jeff now for several years and um, been involved in different organizations across the platform together in sports. So Jeff is Vice President of Alpha Video, uh, Midwest-based, and the Founding Officer Director, and they're really involved in sports entertainment, sports and entertainment. Nearly 30 years of industry experience, 27 of which is at Alpha. Uh, major sports projects in the hundreds at this point, integration, control rooms, sound system, broadcast infrastructure, AV systems, IPTV, very unique knowledge background of technology, fan engagement, really focus on the ROI to help better, better the environment, enhance, better, better enhance uh, fan, fan, fan environment, enhance teams and expand revenue. Thank you so much, Jeff, for joining. And always a pleasure to do another one of these with you. Um, my Boca neighbor, we'll call him for the purpose of this panel, uh, Justin. I'll give a quick wave so people know who you are. Thank you. Uh, he's wearing Team Red today. 
um, not in support of any other foundation other than Misfits, right? Um, Justin, thank you. So Justin is currently the Vice President of Global Brand Partnerships at Misfits, overseeing all branding integrations for all team and influencers, assets within Misfits Gaming. Justin has extensive background in gaming, having been in the space for over a decade. Before coming to Misfits, Justin helped grow and eventually oversaw the North American sales efforts of Playwire, specializing in media and advertising in the video game space. His extensive knowledge of digital video and media landscape as it pertains to video game properties like Steam, My Minecraft, PlayStation Network, Crunchyroll, that's not a sushi roll in case you're wondering, Crackle, and more. He's been featured on several podcast panels pertaining to video games and esports, such as the Gaming Market Awards, Esports Award Business Summit, Orlando Esports Summit, Florida Supercon and Esports Insider Digital Summer. Thank you so much for joining us, Justin. Um, Kevin, you're the last one, don't worry. Um, Kevin, I have a, uh, a lot of experience working with your team out of the Midwest, thank you so much. Um, so Kevin is a, a, a unique in the sense that he's the esports practice leader for one of the largest uh, MEP firms in the country. He's been engaged in all of Henderson's esports projects, serving on the KC, AKA Kansas City Esports Coalition. And he most recently has been working with NACE to develop their league guidelines. With a background in live sound and broadcast and event production, Kevin enjoys the diversity of esports projects to help bring into life an emerging market. Enjoying new challenges every day, he's one of the best at developing practical solutions to even the toughest of challenges. Thank you so much for joining. So we wrote a book on the introduction, so I think we're good there on all introductions. <laughs> uh, thank you guys for being here. And uh, without further ado, uh, we have about 90% of our attendees already here today, so we're going to jump right into it. So a uh, special thank you to our attendees as well. So first question, um, this one's going to be for you, Adrian. Space planning, what to look for a new space? What would be your primary purpose, primary purpose and what would be the secondary purpose? Adrian of IVCI. Sure. Th thanks, Anand. Um, You know, I think for the most part, we're seeing a lot of repurposed spaces. Um, you know, whether you're taking a, a computer lab or a conference space and, and you're converting it into an innovation or a collaboration hub, or maybe you're taking a lecture hall or an auditorium and creating a, a venue or an event space. Um, but we, we like to encourage people to think a bit broader and, and really consider the, the real key drivers in their program uh, and expand what they might expect out of the space. Um, you know, so particularly in ed higher education, uh, we're seeing so much cross-discipline involvement from other areas in the school, um, you know, marketing, communication majors, uh, graphics design, right? They want to take advantage of the space and, you know, the technology that's there. So you might want to consider catering to more than just the gaming requirements. Um, you know, so maybe you're using it as a teaching space during the day or conference rooms during the day, uh, but you know, maybe you want to incorporate some pro or broadcast elements to really expand the use of the space, create content, you know, streaming, you know, what have you. So, I mean, I think if, if you expand your thinking to include more options that that space can provide for you and therefore get more people, you know, jumping on board and, and being involved, you know, that buy-in is really going to afford you a more successful program and, and growth potential in the future as those other areas, you know, develop alongside, you know, so I think as, as you expand the portfolio, um, you'll find better use of this space because it's it's rare that you'll find a singular purposed, you know, gaming studio or lab, you know, nowadays. Excellent. Adrian, thank you so much. Um, same question. Uh, this I will address to Jeff with a J at Alpha. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I think uh, for us, we're focused on a little bit different end of the market. We're focused primarily in the uh, professional end of the market uh, between franchises uh, media publishers or game publishers and, and media production companies. And so the, the needs really vary greatly depending upon uh, your specific instance, right? So even in the pro sports space, uh, we have three different projects right now. One is with a team. And so their team headquarters, much like you would find in um, traditional stick and ball sports, um, have meeting rooms and conference rooms and all of the things that you need to build out in an organization uh, like the Misfits, as an example. Congrats on your, on your win today, by the way, Justin. Um, nice work. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, so we ha you have those spaces, which tend to be more traditional type of AV applications. You really have to think about what you're looking for from an AV space. Um, we have some uh, 
some media groups that are doing primarily programming, right, or events for publishers. Uh, and they have more of a traditional broadcast facility sort of television studio production requirement. And so they'll have entirely different space planning requirements than a team would, even if the team is, is using that space as well. And then on the, the other end of that, we have performance venues or, or purpose-built uh, stadiums that Kevin and his group and others on this panel work on. And those really are a conglomeration of all of those elements, right? Where we have broadcast elements and we have traditional AV elements and uh, sound and indoor uh, LED and other things that Prime View would bring to the table. So uh, space planning is really oftentimes purpose-built for what your primary use case is and your application is. Um, and esports in general is a very broad, all-encompassing term. And so really the, the first step that we have with clients is to really understand what their primary application is. And then that really develops the space program from there. And just to be clear, when he says space, he's not referring to NASA. Correct. Thanks. Thanks for the clarification. Appreciate it. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much. Um, next question. Uh, what does the market look like for integration? in high school, in higher education, in the current moment. And how can we see that growing? Um, I'll give an opportunity to Brandon from AVISBL. Yeah, thanks, Colin. So, you know, from the education perspective, the, the growth of the sport is extremely rapid. Uh, you know, you're looking at a potentially $1.5 billion industry by 2023 um, with a ton of scholarship opportunities. Last year, there were $16 million awarded uh, to scholarships from 200 different institutions, um, which is a pretty substantial amount of money. So you've got all of these capabilities and opportunities for uh, students to facilitate into higher education based on the esports aspects. Uh, you have programs and organizations such as NACE, uh, the National Association of Collegiate Esports, and the North American uh, Scholastic Esports Foundation that are trying to create a little bit more level playing field by instilling those, uh, those standards and looking at those initiatives also to place awareness uh, in education and opportunities for careers in the actual esports uh, uh, party. So I think that one of the really, the really neat things is the community and allowing the dynamics of just everybody is allowed to be involved. And um, just being able to truly, you know, uh, play from, from your, your high school and into, you know, your university capabilities. I think that's a great opportunity. Thank you so much there, Brandon. Uh, very interesting feedback there. You're talking about from a NACE perspective, I know. Um, Adrian, uh, maybe you could just discuss it from your perspective at IBCI, please. would love to hear your thoughts. Same question. Sure. You know, one of the first things that we, we ask people when we're talking to a, a school or university is um, if they have a program or are their students, are they already engaged in some type of group play or competition? Um, and I like it because it's a trick question because they already are, uh, whether they know it or not. You know, so we're finding that esports is a way to, to formalize what's already happening in there and, and create that avenue for that community for them to be able to, to come together and, and, and really participate as one. Um, but we want to talk to people about the elements of esports outside of hardware, right? And purposefully talk about hardware last. And I'm, I'm the AV guy that sells hardware. Um, but the more we understand about what the purpose is, you know, whether it's, you know, building the community, they actually want to compete, you know, and some of them, they just want a place to, to meet and, and have fun, you know, so we can help them shape the technology for their needs today and really provide for the future. Um, but we often encourage them to consider other areas of the school that they can pull in. And, you know, the students, the potential for training and, you know, individual growth of their skills and talents through the other aspects of esports, aside from the actual gameplay, is huge. Um, the casters and content creation, uh, the production ability, event planning, these are all things that students can use in the future, you know, in their field of choice, even if they don't, you know, go into gaming as, you know, as a professional. Um, so taking it back to high school for a second, you know, a lot of these are just ways to get students involved in something in another activity outside of class you know some of these students it's the only thing that they'll be involved in any club or athletics and this is a way to you know as brandon said to include them in something 
but educators are looking for ways to um, make it educational, right? Build a curriculum around it beyond just a club. So, you know, there are some great resources and, and some friends and partnerships we've made, you know, like Varsity Esports, High, high School Esports League, uh, as well as an, a, a whole bunch of STEM grants, and it's growing every year, available to help schools get the technology they need and get started. Um, on the university side of things, you know, the the deans and the executive directors and stuff, they, they want students back on campus as soon and as safely as possible. You know, that's a, to some degree, uh, it's a revenue stream and, and having enrollment is, is really the, the key driver to a lot of their decisions. And esports is a way for them to do that. Um, but the students want more than just traditional athletics and clubs. And, and so esports is that, you know, inclusive opportunity where, you know, students from all backgrounds can come together. Um, one, one last point, uh, we do encourage people to look outside of the school off campus and work with, you know, local businesses that may want to sponsor events or tournaments, you know, things of that nature. Um, it kind of builds on that community culture uh, and it doesn't hurt if they can build some type of revenue stream or, you know, an opportunity to grow that program th through involvement. You know, so cover as many bases as you can and, and, and really broaden your horizon. Yeah, excellent, Adrian. Uh, both you and Brandon, really great points about some of these advances, advancements and the funding process and how to partnership on a local level. And that's really you know, where the opportunities are lying within the high school and higher education at the moment. It's great thoughts there. Uh, thank you. Um, so a, a different little bit of an approach here, but, you know, one of the comments that we got here as, before we get to the next question uh, from an Austin Smith, thank you so much. You know, you talked about, you know, as a comment that there's a concern that there's really lacking on the East Coast events in esports and uh, a little bit of an ad hoc here. But, you know, I'm going to throw this one at Justin, you know, a little bit of an ad hoc here. Why East Coast? I know we're biased on the East Coast, you and I, um, <laughs> but nothing against Kevin either. But um, but Justin, maybe you could address this one. Why is it that it seems like there's always East Coast, something going on with the East Coast that there's, you know, lacking on the East Coast events for esports? Um, I mean, COVID didn't help. So that's a clear, <laughs> it canceled our events that we had planned in Florida. Um, I think, I think it's just a matter of, of you have a lot more esports that had been established out on the West coast. So like you have a lot of conventions out there, you have GDC, E3, a bunch of other like gaming centric kind of, of, of of events going on that obviously esports and off is an offshoot of gaming. So they kind of already have that, that appetite out there. Um, I think you'll see more. I mean, there's, there's PAX East, there's other events. Um, so I, I think you'll start seeing more and more. I mean, uh, we had the, the Fortnite world cup a few years ago. Epic is always planning something big. I think COVID threw off their plans um, and they're on the East coast. So I think, I think you'll start seeing more stuff come up, especially with the teams that are in all these leagues on the East coast too. Like, uh, you have like subliners who put on a great event earlier in the, uh, last year for, for their stuff and ourselves in Atlanta and stuff like that. Um, so they'll, you'll start seeing more stuff. DreamHack was in Atlanta. So I think slowly, but surely we'll get more, we'll get more events. Thank you, Justin. I know I threw that at you, uh, unprepared there. So thank you so much. Hopefully I did a good job. <laughs> uh, so moving right along, you know, one of the questions comes up about facilities and challenges attached to it. So uh, question three, where is the next level of esports facility going and what is currently the biggest challenge? And uh, I'll give this an opportunity for O Sports, uh, Jeff, to address. Thanks, Anand. So I, I, we really see that as the, the industry matures, I, the diversity in the facility type is, is just going to keep growing. Uh, we'll see more purpose-built facilities and also the smaller community centers, but really uh, there's gonna be a range in the middle to address different things for different communities. And that's, I think that's one of the exciting parts is, is now we're seeing that these facilities really can become economic anchors for economic development. And some of the panel has touched on this uh, previously with ties into to education but also as far as um, growth of like-minded businesses uh, in creative and uh, innovative industries, technology, media, advertising, um, all these like-minded uh, disciplines uh, really want to congregate together and, and can be an engine uh, for, to restart or to continue to grow 
parts of cities and communities. So excellent response there. Thank you so much there. And uh, same question, you know, we're talking about like next level of facilities here. You know, Kevin, you've been involved in building and designing, you know, being involved in so many in recent years. You know, your thoughts, same question from Henderson. Yeah, so from a, a building system standpoint, uh, you know, physical builds dedicated to esports is still new and esports is still evolving. So due to that, the, the biggest challenge we try to tackle is making sure that the facility remains flexible for the, the future. Um, esports is likely going to be uh, early adopters of new technology. So that needs to be considered when you're laying out a space and, and designing an esports facility. And more specifically, when you're designing the, the pathways for all building systems, uh, since you know new or additional cabling may be required or additional power or cooling may be required to you know support this this new technology. So uh, doing that will not only allow the facility to, you know, work day one, but it'll also allow it to operate, you know, 10 years down the road. Excellent. You know, it's funny because uh, one of the comments I got, you know, from um, the, one of the attendees was that what kind of technologies are we seeing? And I think that the old days of doing, let's say something, let's say like SDI or the old days of doing something like HD base T, I think those to a large extent are going to be, um, you know, replaced by things of NDI nature. Right, and uh, that's me to address a little more detail of uh, some of the panels coming soon. But we're definitely seeing a huge difference in the technology standpoint. So uh, thank you, Joseph, for the question from the crowd. Um, just moving right along, and next question: You know, how can teams better utilize in-venue screens and signage for their events? So, uh, Justin, I, I think this is a good one for you. Yeah, thanks, Han. Um, I think it depends on you know, the angle you're looking at from, from your venue. Um, you know, I think everyone's touched on a few things here, like multi-use. What are you, what are you using your venue for? Think about that first. And then for us, I mean, if we're going to have consumer based events in there thinking about, at least from my perspective for partnerships, you know, do we get, are those screens in the line of sight of broadcast? Are there ways to engage fans in those screens, uh, creating engagement opportunities with the fan base, um, and just getting your partners more, more visibility. And, and if you're looking at things from like, um, from, from teams utilizing their, their screens in their venue for other events, you know, it could be something where you have a watch party one time, but maybe they're also used as like VOD or scrim reviews. So looking at things, multi-use ways is always valuable. And then, you know, from a money standpoint, how can I get my sponsors on screen more is always something we think about in partnerships. Yeah, then Justin, just to follow up to that, you know, I think, you know, there's always a question people have is that how does sponsorship really shape the events, right? How do they shape them, you know? And maybe are there some of the technology sponsors that are decided on a national versus a franchise? And that came out from uh, our friend Deborah. So it, it depends. Um, sometimes we have events that are like, you know, fully catered to the sponsor. We want to create something very unique and it still has to fit with like what our core competencies are, but you know, can we make it really elaborate and unique for them? And then sometimes there's sponsors that say like, hey, we love what you guys are already doing. We wanna be a part of it. How can we just fit in? So it just depends on kind of who, who your partner is and, and what their goals are and what you're looking to do. Um, so it's a very broad range of how the, how the sponsor really kind of dictates, if you will, the event. Um, from a, like a technology standpoint, I guess, like, you know, there, there's all sorts of things we look at, um, you know, whether that's from, from mobile playing, can we engage, engage the fans on a second screen? Can we, can we do things to heighten the experience? Um, you know, what sort of stuff can we put over, overlay the broadcast and AR, things like that. So it just depends. There's a lot of things that go into it and how, how a sponsor will kind of shape out the event. Thank you, Justin. So, uh, from, you know, Brand, uh, Brandon, I'm, I'm curious from your perspective and, and, you know, as being one of the largest AV integration, you know, firms here in the U.S., you know, how are you, you know, getting involved in, you know, for teams to better utilize in venue screens and signs for their events? You know, I'd love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we keep constantly talking about the hybrid solution and, and different aspects of, of ways to use specific products in multiple fashions. And I think, you know, displays and screens are one of the the most important aspects of you know that that esports uh, visualization perspective you have to be able to see what's going on but in the in the response to you know covid and 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 the situation a lot of universities are are asking hey 
can we take our labs and stream from our labs because they're typically going to be smaller places and stream them to other places on property. And I think that that's another way to just utilize um, these displays from a large perspective and a large uh, viewing perspective, giving that hybrid solution. So streaming it to their student union building and installing direct ULED there and being able to truly engage your, your, your participants with, you know, the, the crowd that's able to watch now and be engaged, even though they can't be in the room, it's like they are. And I think that that's where the dynamic is, is starting to develop too, uh, because we are trying to follow as much of the guidelines with, with COVID regulations, but also playing into the, into the turn of how are we future-proofing it? How are we giving it the capability to still be able to utilize these even after the, the, the COVID situation? Where are we gonna use these, uh, these displays from? Yeah, Brandon, you raised a lot of good points there because one of the comments from one of the attendees, uh, Lisa Murray, was that, you know, technology is changing so quickly. And the reality is, is that while we always have to be budget conscious about how much money and what resources we're putting where, it is important, like Lisa Murray alluded, alluded to, is that it, it is a challenge to recommend and have that flexibility and make sure that you have things that are in place that is good today and also good for the future, uh, which is something that uh, Lisa Marie were then addressable later in some of the other questions as well. So Brandon, thank you. And uh, just Lisa Marie, hold on to your seat. It's coming up. So next question we have, you know, um, how are venues helping teams capture events while monetizing them more effectively? So monetization is a big topic um, and someone that does partnerships, let's say Justin, for example, for Misfits, I think definitely well prepared to answer this one. Yeah, I, I think looking at the current state, you know, thinking about, I think a lot of people have their eyes open on, on what we could do if live events go away. So venues or, or areas in, in buildings, like something we're talking about with our own HQ is, is can we have a centralized broadcast area where we are pulling in feeds from all over to create a, a broadcast that goes out, um, which Brandon touched on. Um, and, and, and I think that's, you know, how do we monetize that? Do we, do we create special content? Um, do we create custom pieces of content that get pushed out? Do we have live events or, you know, live tournaments that are all put from there, uh, broadcast from there? Um, so I think that's important is being able to create content uh, for the teams and being able to kind of sell those content packages, uh, if you will, to sponsors. And, and really, without those live events, that's been, a, I think, a major component to, you um, you know, what a lot of teams are doing now. Like, how can we own our own broadcast? How can we push out our own content? How do we distribute that more effectively? How do we create it more efficiently? So all those things tie into, can, can we build that all into a venue ourselves? Do we have to work with a, a, another place that has all that stuff for us? You know, that's the decisions the ownership groups make, but I mean, everyone has to think of that now um, with COVID. So I think that'll maintain past even when events come back. Excellent, Justin. I, I think you give a really interesting perspective from an actual, you know, gaming company like yours and the teams that you represent. So I'd love to hear from an integration standpoint, uh, Jeff from Alpha, please. Yeah, I think I would echo a lot of the things that Justin said. Right, I, I think if you go to enough esports seminars, um, different events, uh, you'll hear within the first day multiple conversations about monetization, right, and how people besides game publishers. Um, the folks making Call of Duty, you know, how, how those guys are making money, but others are trying to figure out what the monetization model looked like even before COVID. And so COVID made that even more difficult with the halting of in-person events, obviously. And so um, sponsorships, to Justin's point, becomes a huge element of what drives this market. And so what we saw as COVID came about, um, you know, is that in-venue things, that had to pivot. So we worked with a lot of publishers on uh, cloud-based production tools, as an example, and things were outside of uh, sort of the norm of how those events were being produced uh, to allow them to continue to produce events and, and move gameplay, which inherently has been online for a long time, into a realm that then could also have production and broadcast elements and allow them to produce events um, in a very similar manner. And so that's been a big, huge piece of what we've been working on. Again, mostly on the publisher side and, and media company side of this as they look to, um, to get events on the air. 
I think moving forward and working under an assumption that everyone likes to work under that we will return to in-person events at some point in time, right? Um, and I think the, you know, uh, perhaps Jeff and Kevin can, can concur that there's still a lot of um, purpose-built larger venues on the roadmap for people as they look for COVID to exit. So I think the key becomes then um, replicating an experience um, like fans are used to, not just in esports events, but in other traditional, um, not just sporting events, but also sort of hospitality and nightlife events, right? A lot of um, the esports spaces that we're working in today from a monetization standpoint really sort of take elements of um, a gaming center, uh, some virtual reality centers and gaming centers that you can go to today, um, a competition-based venue that might have three, 5,000 seats to host live events, and then also a lot of uh, traditional hospitality and nightclub bar and, and, and food service type elements. And so um, technology, again, drives across all of those different uh, avenues across AV and broadcast and sound and uh, large format display. So I think teams and facilities are looking to be creative in what they can do virtually and online to ensure that if they do need to pivot to that again, that they've established a monetization and a revenue stream that can, uh, and an infrastructure to Justin's point. And yes, Justin, you can do all of those things. You can bring in all those broadcast feeds. I, I know somebody that can help you with that. Um, and uh, and we can uh, and, and have that available should it need to be available. Um, but also once they get back in venue, um, what the venue experience looks like to get fans back. Um, if you've never been to a large esports event like a League of Legends event or a Call of Duty event, um, it's pretty remarkable, right? Uh, we had we hosted uh, in the Twin Cities last year the Call of Duty League opening weekend, and, and it was it, it blew my mind. And, and I've done you know a hundred and some traditional sports venues, and it was like an experience um, that I hadn't that I hadn't necessarily uh, had before in some of those venues. So. I think there's a huge appetite for it um, and, and just planning what that's going to look like is a, is a big piece of it. And technology certainly plays into that. Absolutely. Well, Jeff, thank you for your answer there. I think, you know, we had some questions that came out in the crowd and I think it's, it's, it's really different. You know, you know, Sam, Sam Wilbur had a question about expectations of fans. How does it differ from esports, rather traditional sports? And like you said, Jeff, it, it's, it's a different world. It's a really a different world, right? It's so different. It is. And I think Justin can 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 add on to this. But I think the you know, the, the fan experience is different. Right. In that uh, a Call of Duty event, um, you might have fans that show up at 11 in the morning and then they don't leave until 10 o'clock at night. Right. It's not like going to a baseball game or a football game where you might show up and you'll do a little bit of tailgating. Um, you'll overserve yourself. You might go to part of the game or none of the game and then you leave and go home. Right. Um, whereas, again, these fans show up. Um, and they want to support their own team, um, but they're also, there's not just the team element, there's their fans of the game, they're fans of the platform, right? Call of du a, a fan that goes to a Call of Duty League event goes to that event because he might be a fan of the Minnesota Rocker or of the Florida Mutineers, but he's also a fan of Call of Duty, right? Um, and likely a bigger fan of Call of Duty in general than he is of any of those teams. And then even beyond the teams, he might be a fan of some of the individual athletes that are members of the teams, right? Because they followed him on Twitch for years before they became a member of the team. And so, um, you know, having facilities that can, that are equipped from a hospitality perspective and from auxiliary areas where they can game themselves and you can have smaller um, events and other things in the venue are all important to that monetization piece and to capturing the fan. Because again, it's not just a one, two, three hour event. These are six, nine, 12 hour day long events where people show up and they're there. And that just for one day, they're there for three days, right? They're there, they're there Friday night. They're there for the concert afterwards. They're there all day Saturday, the concert afterwards, all day Sunday, and then the closing thing. So um, it, it is a, a far different <laughs> fan experience. Yeah, I think you nailed it. I just try to tell people think of think of esports events more like a music festival than a sporting event. Like that, really. Like if you think of like, okay, there's tons of stuff. There's like twelve teams playing in three days, and there's like concert later. And then there's like this activity and booths to play games and win prizes. And it's just it's just a different. It's like there's so much going on at them, and and I think there's even room for more for things to go on. But 
that's what I try to tell people. Think of it like that, not so much like a traditional sporting event. Yeah, really good comments there, Justin. I, I think, you know, a lot of things that people, you know, it's hard for them to understand. I know uh, we had someone, um, one of the attendees, um, um, Chris Postel from Game, Game Arena, you know, in Cincinnati, you know, you know, from business models of large venues, you know, convention centers, mixed uses, there's so many different ways to make a viable model. And it really depends on who your partners are, you know, and, and how you're going to go about this and monetization. So the reality is it's always different. So uh, thank you, Chris, for uh, the question there in the field. Um, uh, the same question really about, you know, how are venues helping teams capture events while monetizing them more effectively? Uh, same question uh, to Jeff from O Sports, please love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, um, so to kind of uh, pivot a little bit to the, 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 the singular event, really when we're looking at purpose-built facilities that are flexible, we're, we're looking to plan out and really program those facilities so they, they can operate on, on a daily basis. So you, you're not just looking at multiple revenue streams during the event, which is very important and, and absolutely different activities and um, events within that space. Uh, are important to uh, attract tickets, but also ticket sales, but also uh, extend into the future. Uh, we want to design these spaces so the event doesn't really, they can have multiple events, but not choke down on the facility. So the gaming station can still be in operation for potential foot traffic. Um, you, a media center could stay in operation uh, for, for leasable um, use for content production. Uh, really, you know, if it is, a, is it a destination based facility? Is it attached to use the youth sports industry, which is something that is starting to trend? Um, you know, all these all these different components really dictate on on how we set up uh, that initial program and look at it. So, as far as food and beverage, you know, is, is it a really grab and go? Uh, when it's coming to more youth driven, or if it's more call it eighteen plus a different elevation of food and beverage uh, within the facility. And then really it, it's down to the flexibility of that event space. And, and uh, the panel keeps touch, touching on it. It's, it's really important to be able to hold not just esports events in these facilities, but like-minded events such as concerts, trade shows, lectures, uh, movies, you know, et cetera, to keep um, the revenue stream more current and, and flexible. Excellent. Thank you. There's so much, Jeff, from Osport. So a, a question came in on the side, and uh, I think it's a good opportunity, uh, Brandon, just on the cuff there for you from ABISBL, being a Florida resident. So a question came in from someone in Jacksonville, um, actually a campus president uh, for one of the universities. Uh, she asked, you know, if someone is a newbie, what event would you recommend attending to get a, you know, a little bit of a flavor for esports here in Florida? Well, uh, if all of Misfits events weren't canceled, I would say one of their events. Um, but from that perspective, you know, it, it, it's hard on the East Coast in the current moment, uh, obviously, with stuff being canceled. So I would, you know, Justin, I, I would kind of come to you on that perspective to see if you are aware of anything going on this year in the current time. Um. I think there'll be some stuff later this summer. Um, you know, Jeff with a J hit it. You know, I think if you, if you, if you want to get kind of blown away, I, I say like, I never, like I wasn't a huge esports fan. I was a big gamer, but growing up, I wasn't like an esports fan. It was kind of, I was kind of like, I'm a little older than that. Most of esports fans. But when I went to an esports event, I was like, whoa, this is like really cool. The energy is out of control. It's hard to explain how energized the crowd is and how that's infectious. Um, so I would say, you know, if there's any kind of Call of Duty event, League of Legends event, big event like that, um, where you can watch people playing live and compete, I think that's a really, it's a really kind of, you're not dipping your toe and you're jumping in head first, but it's worth it. So and you can always, to add to that, you can always start to look for some streams as the, the tournaments are going on. That would give you a good idea of what the field looks like, you know, how they're playing and just the intricacies of every, every aspect. Um, so it kind of gives you a baseline. And then that would give you a good idea in the current state, you know, that would, that would allow you to see what's going on. Said Brandon, thank you. Florida resident there as well. Um, 
Next question. Uh, how is COVID-19 affecting the design of esports facilities? I think having an MEP perspective here, uh, I'll give this one to Henderson. Yeah, so there's there's three primary things that uh, we recommend clients to consider um, due to the, the current situation we're in with, with COVID and then you know, also planning for any future pandemics. Um, so the first one is flexibility. You know, can the space be designed to allow for multiple configurations? You know, can the space be designed to accommodate social distancing? And then uh, also does technology infrastructure need to be incorporated to allow for either streaming or live viewing of uh, events if in-person events aren't allowed or if you know reduced audience sizes are, are still in place? How do you attract more people to your event? And then the second one is uh, mechanical systems. So for mechanical systems, uh, for new construction, you know, the, the best option is to design the system for one directional airflow. So if, if you consider an arena, this would be air being distributed from say under the seat and then being returned to the air handler high up uh, at the middle of the, the roof. So this would reduce the potential for um, say air that's passing in front of a person that's five seats away from you uh, coming in front of you. Uh, so it reduces that that air mixture in front of people. Um, this is a, a great design concept, but it's it's almost impossible to retrofit into an existing facility. So for renovations, really the the main thing for mechanical systems that we recommend considering is providing good filtration on the the recirculated air throughout the facility. And then the the final one is is reviewing where you can reduce uh, potential touch points. So whether that's uh, touchless fixtures in restrooms or touchless door hardware, anything like that, anywhere that you can reduce uh, touching throughout the facility will, will only benefit you. Excellent thoughts there, Kevin. It's funny because you, you and I, we worked on a project with your firm recently um, in Wisconsin and the amount of portability that was requested just you know, from a future standpoint, because no one really knows how everything's how long everything's going to take and when people are going to be in each individual environment, individual environments. We saw a lot of mobility requests are coming there too. So it's interesting to see how much HVAC and some of these touchless environments continues to be, you know, a request there. And, uh, you know, that was really from an MVP perspective, you know, Adrian from IVCI as an integrated perspective, would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's same thing in, in corporate and, and education and even, you know, healthcare and such the, the, this, instant gravitation towards this health and safety related technology, right? You're seeing the temp scanners, the people counting, the, um, you know, the proximity as people are walking, you know, through space. I mean, that, that has come quickly and it doesn't matter whether it's esports or anything that's to some degree prevalent everywhere. Um, but what we're trying to get people to focus on is being more flexible, right? It's putting a whole bunch of money into that tech now, you know, Kevin said it right. It may, we may come back to this at some point in the future. Um, I don't necessarily believe that we want to put all of our money into to scanners for every single square foot of a place because I, I think we might hopefully move on. Um, but we're seeing other areas where we want to be more flexible with space, as we talked about a few times here before. Uh, we're also seeing a real big emergence of companies that support remote production you know, of, of players. Um, one of our partners, UEA, Unified Esports Association, you know, that's become their their prime business, you know, through all of this is to continue hosting tournaments and where the players are, you know, they're at home. On the, on the school side and even corporate side, you, there's going to be some concerns that grow over security and, you know, network control of those players and where they are. And, and there are some software solutions available now that that can help. Um, but I think really the most important thing is to think beyond what's happening right now um, and, and plan to be flexible and accommodate through, you know, whether it's, you know, financial ease of access and, and as a service models, um, you know, financing and, and such like that, or just providing room for growth in the systems that you invest in now. Yeah, that definitely addressed a lot, of Adrian, because we had some comments, you know, and from some of the attendees about, you know, the future growth mentality and you nailed it. I mean, that definitely is important to not just think about COVID-19 today and health and safety, but flexibility for moving forward. So thank you. Um, uh, the same question about COVID-19 affecting design of esports. You know, I would love to hear, you know, from Misfits Gaming perspective, Justin, you know, you know, you guys have production studios. I mean, what's it like for you guys? Yeah, I, I, 
so right off the bat, I mean, there were, we went from LAN events to everyone playing remote. So how do we provide the best competitive advantage potentially for our players to play? So you have to think about, all right, you want to have backup redundancies with your lines coming in. How many gig lines up and down do you have coming in for your players? Um, you know, so that's the first part. Then it's, you know, are we going to be making more content? Are we going to be filming more stuff um, that we can broadcast remotely um, from like a centralized broadcast area like we've talked about a few times? And that's all stuff for even I think with with live events coming back, I don't think those things are going to decrease. I'm obviously not maybe playing competitively from our offices, but you know, I definitely think the amount of content teams are going to produce will, will maintain really high. I think, you know, putting on broadcast where can we pull feeds from everywhere in one location is still going to still going to happen. Um, and then looking at things like from a consumer standpoint in the future, it's how do we work with connectivity better? What things can we do from a mobile perspective? You know, you have, you have you know, touchless entry and, and things on your phone. Can you can you get into the venue quicker? Do I want to uh, disseminate queue lines? I don't want people standing and congregating in one big line. Like how are things we can move along those things quicker too? We've looked at. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think all in all, it's just basically for, for us, usually it's, it's going to be, how can we do the things we want to do better? And, you know, eventually um, on, on my jobs to monetize those. So that can we monetize them? But for us, it's, it's, it's that taking things in house and, and making sure things run a lot quicker and, and more effectively. Excellent, Justin. Thanks so much for giving your perspective. You know, I think one of the other questions that always come up about esports is that, and we had several comments about it. And one of them recently uh, from one of the panelists, Gordon, thank you so much for bringing this up. We're addressing this right now, um, as well as Adam uh, Stanton from ABI SPL. Thank you. You know, how to support esports in an existing facility, right? May that be a convention center, right? Um, maybe that be a uh, moving movie theater, right? I mean, are people going to these locations? Maybe we could repurpose them. So Kevin uh, from Kansas City, and it's only appropriate thing that AMC is in your area. Good opportunity for you to address that one. Yeah, yeah, we're hoping AMC will uh, look into that. That would be great. Um, but we, we've done this uh, with Esports Stadium Arlington. I mean, that was an existing uh, convention center that uh, renovated into, you know, being a facility that can support esports events um, year round. So it is a model that's already been in place and I'm sure we'll continue to, to move forward as um, more convention centers kind of see this as a potential uh, event that they could, could bring in. But um, really the things that, you know, need to be considered, uh, you know, technology and technology infrastructure um, bring these esports facilities to life. So um, all of these uh, systems re result in additional cooling and power load for the facility. So, it's important to understand what the existing uh, power and cooling capacity of the facility is um, to understand if, you know, that can be reused or um, if something new needs to be provided if you're looking at adding um, esports to an existing facility. So, and the other big aspect with, if you're gonna look at uh, reutilizing existing equipment, especially if you're reutilizing um, an existing central plant, is it's important to understand the operation and capacity during swing seasons, um, since required cooling for technology systems is, is year round. Um, so a lot of central plants will ramp down during the swing seasons where, you know, that cooling capacity is, is constant uh, throughout the year. Um, so all of this can have a, a large effect on the, the project budget um, when you're, you're looking at this and also at the space planning, um, either physical locations for the, the new equipment that may be needed and which could lead to structural concerns, especially if you have to start adding, you know, additional rooftop units or different things to, um, to the project. So it's, it's definitely something to uh, think of early in a project because uh, you'll want to get a, a handle on it. Um, and then outside of just the, the power and cooling, um, the, one of the biggest aspects, which Justin kind of mentioned is, you know, your connection to your internet service provider. Um, and really understanding what the planned usage of your facility is going to be and what that requires. You know, does your existing connection have sufficient bandwidth? Um, you know, is a redundant connection required? You know, the ISP connection in the telecom infrastructure um, is, is, you know, really the primary backbone. So 
it's important to have a plan uh, for that system from the start to really have a successful um, facility at the end of it. Excellent thoughts there. I, I think, you know, from an existing facility, you really nailed down a lot of the key issues there and uh, wanted to open up the same question from an architectural standpoint, you know, you know, Jeff from O Sports, I mean, there's a lot of firms out there that are uh, struggling for this one. You know, what, what are, what, what is O Sports doing in these environments about existing facilities for e to make them for esports? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, so really what, if possible, what we like to do is, is get involved um, early on. Uh, be, before we even get to the the facility, the existing facility, so really help with facility uh, selection, and really for that, it, it's tying it back to the performa, the target market, and the the goals for the project. So th that's going to really dictate on what type of existing space you'd really want to seek out. So if it's if it's a smaller venue, kind of maybe the the first stage in, in a startup for esports commercial office space uh, or, or retail space that might de, be distressed um, uh, can, can be nicely repurposed at a lower cost point. But, you know, really, if, if you're getting into the larger event sizes um, where we're getting into maybe 1,500 seats plus, now you, you'd want to take a look at theaters, which are, are great to repurpose because they're already designed and have a lot of the infrastructure that uh, is similar to esports, um, but also there could be um, convention centers, manufacturing, warehouses, um, really places that have the, the long span that is required for an event space and production studio. So production studio, uh, they, they can range in size, but it does take an open area, uh, and, and back to what Kevin was saying, uh, the structure uh, to support lighting grids and, 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 and rigging for the live event. And so we like to take a step back and really help guide them with that site selection. And then uh, once we're there, we can start to build in the infrastructure and the space. Thank you, Jeff. I mean, hearing about these existing facilities and especially because of COVID that some of these businesses unfortunately are underperforming, mm -hmm. knowing that there's a plan in place to potentially go and repurpose them. I mean, it's definitely a really interesting space to uh, even consider. Thank yeah, you. it's, um, you know, non-traditional. Uh, malls uh, are, are really becoming uh, prevalent um, right now. Um, and then, you know, up here in, in the, the Northeast, you know, former manufacturing facilities that, that have that, that robust framework um, and are, are still close to the city core for foot traffic are becoming uh, really popular venues to look at as well. Yeah, so be before we go into one of our last questions here uh, and then jump into the lightning round, I guess we'll call it, um, you know, I, uh, we had an interesting question that came out uh, from Patrick Sunday, you know, formerly Fox uh, production analyst, um, technical director at Verizon and then Bank of America and then Major League Baseball, you know, really unique experience. And he asked a question, really, I think this is really a good one for Jeff Olk from Alpha. You know, what are some of the top brands for remote solutions in covid and post COVID for esports, you know, I and mean, from an integrated perspective, I know you deal with this a lot from a production capability side. What technology, what solutions for remote stuff are you looking at? Uh, so that that is uh, that's uh, much like capturing esports in one foul swoop. Um, that's a, a very broad. <laughs> that's a very broad question, right? So um, I think it's uh, it's largely dependent on what your needs are, right? Uh, if you're looking to encode and decode signals. And get them from one place to another and use more of a traditional sort of Remy broadcast environment or Grammy um, broadcast environment. There's certainly um, a, a bunch of manufacturers that excel in that space. Um, there's similarly, if you need largely cloud-based transport and you need uh, cloud-based routing and multi-viewing and other solutions, um, there's products like Gallery Siena, which we've been uh, very successful with and used to power things like the NFL draft and all of the iPhone feeds that were in um, coaches and athletes homes. Uh, and so we put that infrastructure together with uh, some partners for that event. So um, the answer to that question, like many of these questions, right, including some of the ones we're going to touch on last, are largely dependent on a, on a needs assessment. But one of the things that COVID has done is it's accelerated the development, certainly in the broadcast side of the industry, um, when it comes to remote technologies and remote contribution and remote production technologies vastly. We were sort of slowly um, going down some paths that broke away from some traditional production models. 
Um, but COVID has really created a, a demand for innovation um, that accelerated that market by probably at least, uh, you know, at least 18 months, 12 to 24 months. Uh, and so depending on needs, there's a, a variety of technologies that are all very reliable, very proven at a variety of price points um, and capabilities that, that all can fit various applications. Thank you so much, Jeff. I know I threw out, you know, a little bit off the cuff there, but uh, Patrick, definitely uh, feel free to reach out to Jeff uh, directly afterwards. Um, I know you have a different media background and a lot of different production needs. So definitely connect with Jeff on that one. Clearly the right guy for that one. So uh, last question before we head into our, our lightning round, we'll call it. Um, so who on your staff is responsible for selecting, operating and maintaining your technology systems? So this is not an easy one, but uh, you know, I'll give uh, uh, Brandon the first knock at this, please. Yeah, so I think, you know, obviously it's a, a multi-tiered question. And from the responsibility of selecting the equipment, I mean, that's a collaborative opportunity. Uh, you first have to figure out what you're designing. What game platform are you playing? Because multiple different platforms will have multiple different players. And one of the things that, you know, we look at is as you're starting to develop your your esports program, you want to be able to expand with that program, obviously, as it, you know, continues in time. So one of the things that we always try to convey is the fact that, you know, you have these different platforms. So let's look at the games, see which ones are of interest and see how we can future proof that and build it to a larger perspective. And then going back to that hybrid solution of, of once the install happens, and I'm going to kind of come from a uh, higher education perspective is now you have these opportunities of operation for different school programs to get involved beyond just the gamers. So you have, you know, your broadcast capabilities, your lighting, you have audio, and then you have content creation capabilities. You know, as we all know, Twitch and YouTube are massive and just being able to the knowledge and education on how to work in these different facets is, is going to be astronomical and it's also growing. So that's kind of one of the things from an operational perspective that, that needs to, to be evaluated. Um, so, and then as we go through all these different programs, we kind of communicate to the end users on how we can, we can bring it all together. And, um, you know, that's kind of the job of the integrator is to, to, to hold their hand and walk them through and be able to, you know, educate them if they are just basing that pro program, you know, newly. And uh, if it's an established program, it's going to be the same model, but just from a different kind of perspective. Excellent. Brandon, thank you so much. I think hearing an integrated perspective on these things is so important. And, you know, everyone has a different, different experience, you know, and from that standpoint, also from a staffing side of things, you know, Jeff from Alpha, you know, what, what are things to consider here? Yeah, I think, again, staffing and who's responsible for decisions uh, is kind of across the board. This is an emerging space. And so um, you have a, a, on the client side, you have a, mis, a mishmash of people um, crossing even generational boundaries, right? And so you'll have old guys like me that might be in charge of uh, facilities and IT and other various things. And you'll have um, even, you know, on a team level or professional level, um, you'll have uh, some very, very bright and talented young folks that have been uh, figuring out ways to, to create streams out of their living room that are high quality broadcasts for a long, long time. And you, you, so you have a lot of people that have a lot of different ideas on how to tackle this. I think much like I've said about other things, um, it's about understanding client needs, right? And so um, oftentimes these are more collaborative efforts than even in other ways, because there's so many different things to consider, um, especially as you move from a team facility to a purpose-built venue uh, to perhaps more of a production studio environment. And so I think the thing that, that also needs to be considered is not just what your short-term investment is, uh, whether you're a high school or a university um, or you're you know, Misfits Gaming, 
Um, because this is very much IT centric at its core and many of these technologies are IT centric, um, the purchasing models are different than people have been used to procuring technology in the past. So um, to Adrian's point earlier, we see a lot more um, as a service models or we see more traditional IT procurement models where there's a very low upfront CapEx cost and then an ongoing OpEx cost that comes year over year. So having an understanding of how you're funded, not just for the short term, um, but for the intermediate term and the long term is also critically, uh, critically important uh, because a lot of clients, um, both in traditional sports spaces and in esports spaces, um, and a lot of investors make the mistake of assuming that I built a facility and that cost me X dollars. And now that's my chunk of money that I've invested in that technology core and that technology piece. And that's going to run for four years, six years, eight years, 10 years. And in traditional broadcast, that was a thing that could happen. You know, you could run a lot of those systems for a long time. Now, a lot of these systems turn very, very quickly um, in an IT space. And so um, avoiding the assumption that you've made a spend and that's your spend and there's no ongoing operational um, or maintenance costs is a big mistake that we see a lot of people make and we try to advise against. Thank you, Jeff. I think, you know, you raise a lot of interesting points and we see this as you, as you know, you know, when we work together on production environments, you know, like the, the Minnesota Vikings practice facility we did together and others, there's always that hard question, even on a fixed opera, you know, hardware cost, which is either you're going this route on resolution or you're future proofing for this. And you're thinking about how much you're streaming and at what pipelines and how you're going to get these there and how you're going to distribute these things. These are hard conversations to have. And even the investors, as you alluded to, they don't always know, as technology is evolving, what's entailed. I mean, that's why having an MEP firm involved, having an integration firm involved, you know, having an architectural firm that's involved that has these practice leaders, which is really every one of the people on this panel, which is very unique to have. So uh, very blessed to have these kind of people here and everybody even post uh, the recording that will be available to everybody afterwards. I encourage the attendees to reach out to each one of these panelists if you have additional questions to understand better what is an operating expense, what is a cap or cap expense, and what makes sense to deploy when. Um, and it's pretty funny because as we, you know, coming to the end of the uh, the panel and now getting to the lightning round, I'll call it, it's crazy. We we went almost an hour without mentioning the word merch. I, I, I was shocked. I was shocked. Um, but it's okay. Uh, Justin will give a coupon code for those afterwards who want merch. Um, throwing you under the bus there, Justin. Um, and if, if the sponsor, what, what is it? We got plenty of merch. Okay. And even if they lose a sponsor, get a new sponsor, the merch has its home. Deborah, Deborah knows where all that merch is buried. Um, <laughs> give a shout out for Deborah there. Um, okay. So last, last question. This is really, this is the, the final question. Uh, really more like a lightning round, I guess it would call it. So, Really key things that people are talking about, monetization, network design, fan and Patreon optimization, security threats, right? AI, VR, AR. What are the key trends you should be watching to integrate into new designs or even those existing spaces that say like Kevin spoke about, you know, like movie theaters. Uh, first up, I'll give uh, one of my locals here or Florida resident, I would call him. Uh, Brandon, I'll let you go first. Yeah, um, so... From my perspective, one of the, the big aspects is, is viewership. So as viewership grows, so does every aspect of the sport, um, popularity and, and just that drive. But as the viewership grows, we also have to develop that hybrid solution. I know we go back to that word a lot, but the capability for patrons who are, who are there at the event to be able to watch, but it also from a streaming perspective, have the same level of engagement. So I think that as we continue on uh, and, and as the sport continues to grow, that augmented reality, uh, you know, virtual boards and uh, uh, virtual reality is going to continue to, to expand within the sport to give both streamers and viewers in a local playing field the same level of, of enjoyment and engagement. I think that's going to be one of the big driving forces. Excellent. I really appreciate your feedback there. I mean, you know, you have a ton of experience there and all these different platforms. Great feedback there. Um, also from an integrated perspective, Jeff from Alpha, I love your thoughts. 
Yeah, I think uh, it's been touched on a couple of times by Kevin and Justin and some others, but really uh, networking is such a critical element to this. And and not to offend any of my friends in the IT space that may be on the call, but um, when you're when you're building competitive gaming lands, um, this isn't like putting together a Microsoft Office stack um, that's going to do email and do Word documents and set up your SharePoint system. Um, and so there's some, some guaranteed QoS things and some latency issues and other very critical network design elements that are related just to the gameplay to make it fair and make it competitive that are incredibly important to understand. Um, as well as, as we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about remote production and, you know, com com competition over the internet and cloud-based things and all of these variety of different things. And so um, not just your internal building structure, but having a very good handle on what your, your telecom structure looks like with your external partners and redundant circuits and all of the things um, that reside around bandwidth and networking. Are, are easily and oftentimes overlooked or um, assumed that can be handled um, because it's just IT, right? It's just a network. Um, and, and I would encourage people to, to maybe look at that a little bit more closely as not just a, a traditional IT network. Yeah, I think you nailed it, Jeff. You know, it's funny, we're building right now in Florida, not a stadium, obviously, but, you know, a small experience center, just 4,500 square feet. And one of the first questions I wrote, I you know, I raised to my CTO is, bandwidth, connectivity, what are we prepared for on the network side? And it's so overlooked. And why do I know, why did I even think about that? Because, well, you know, in New York, you know, we, when we built our original showroom, we had issues. So now I'm trying to just do a little better. And I, I urge everybody to plan for these things. You know, if you don't plan for it in the beginning, it's not going to be there at the end. <laughs> these are not things you could always think about until it's over sometimes. So thank you, Jeff. And uh, thanks for being involved in the panel. Um, Next, um, I would love to hear the same question, you know, Kevin, from an MVP perspective, you know, let's talk about that. You know, what, what are you seeing as some of these things for new designs or existing things to be worried about or to consider? Yeah, so one thing I'll add to the, the network design question is, uh, you know, the, the player network is definitely uh, very important and to support all the um, infrastructure for broadcast and everything. But one portion of the network design that sometimes gets overlooked is the uh, network that's supporting the patron experience. Uh, Esports fans are some of the most well-connected fans, and they're going to be the ones that are uh, going to be on social media and, and posting things um, live while they're at the event. So it's very important to make sure that there's also a robust wireless network um, throughout the facility to support those fans. And then in addition, you know, security is a high priority in these uh, facilities. Um, this is not only uh, including player safety, um, but there's a lot of expensive equipment in an esports facility, uh, facility, whether that's in public areas um, or private areas that could be stolen or damaged. So it's, it's important to have a well thought out um, risk mitigation plan um, as you're putting uh, developing this facility and also developing you know, proper security procedures. Um, so these uh, intricacies of, of these esports facilities can be um, taken into account and uh, shared with staff that will be actually operating the facility. And just to give a nice shout out there, Henderson is one of the rare MEP firms that have not just the IT, not just the AV, uh, but the security uh, divisions within their firm that have the capability to help you design these things. So uh, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, so definitely reach out to Kevin and his colleagues uh, if you're looking for more holistic approach to all the different uh, elements that are required there. And, you know, we, we talked about a little more of the details, but let's talk a little more of a broad stroke for a second there. You know, Jeff from O Sports, same question for you. Yeah, so I, I think that's flex, going back to flexibility uh, is really important, but also as AR and VR really start to trend, um, having soft space planned into these facilities uh, for that growth just for his physical size. But then also, you know, almost full circle back to the beginning of the discussion, uh, the ability to incorporate educational and training um, uh, rooms, um, smaller caster studios, uh, really all, all of the educational and training components and, and all that space that may be needed by a university or high school um, for extension programs, et cetera, are, are definitely things to consider. Um, looking into the future and then and then the most basic thing is that that flexibility for the event space uh being able to host multiple 
uh, event types and styles uh, is very important. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for your feedback. You know, having a you know having a firm like O Sports, where your team has so much experience in designing these facilities from an architectural standpoint, you know, really is helpful. And also that knowing that you're backed by an MVP firm as well it gives you a very broad range. So thank you for being involved. Thank you, um, Adrian. You know, IBCI is a very unique you know firm. And you know has a lot of different disciplines as well. And from an integration standpoint, same question to you. We've said it a few times, but I'm going to hammer it down one last time and give it a name: technology lifecycle management. Right? Call it planned obsolescence, like our cell phones, or useful life of certain computers and things like that. You really need to understand, you know, what you're investing in and what your plans are. You know, again, whether you're you're a school building a club. You know, or you're building an entire venue. You, you've got to have a plan beyond you know the immediate moment, and that's not just equipment. That's the support and everything else that we're talking about. And you can buy the best facility in the world, but if you don't have the right people supporting you there and remotely to to affect the support for technology and equipment that may go bad, you know that's that's a reality of the world that we live in. That you need support from partners and you know people on boots on the ground. You know, so just take a holistic view to what you're doing and, and don't get stuck into hey, I want to play this game and I need four computers. See you tomorrow. I think that start that way and and end up falling short. You know, and in particularly when you've got students and kids that have have a dream of making it one way, you know, you want to set them up in the best chance you, that you can. Excellent, Adrian. Thank you so much for your thoughts there, and thank you so much for your involvement, obviously, in the panel as a whole. Um, last, last, uh, I'll give the last dibs here to Justin, uh, only because you're the closest one in the zip code to me. Uh, from Misfits' perspective, you know, tell us what you think. You know, new designs, existing spaces. Last word. Well, I think a lot of people have touched on uh, this topic, and and these everyone on this line is is you know been doing integration for spaces much more than I've been in esports. But you know, think about. Um, just how you can get the most out of your space. So, you know, setting up for multi-use, like your stream room could also be a small studio where you maybe might have you know, some, some studio space where you want to do shoots could also be where you might also have some, you know, live viewing parties where there's a big screen and stuff. So I think, I think making the most out of, out of all your space is important to look at. Then also think about um, what I always say to look at is something we touched on is, is capability or can, like, what do you need for your space? Make sure you have what you need. Um, it's very expensive to go backwards. As, as Hanan, we had to go do, right? We had to raise a ceiling because our studio space was too small for the video wall. So, you know, you got to go back and be like, well, you know, if you want it in there, you got you to gotta raise it up. So stuff like that. And uh, so just looking at those things right off the bat. Um, and I guess something from more of a future standpoint, I think ARs, Utilized a lot on streaming. How can we do more with AR? I think it's underutilized in esports. Um, I think there's so much we can do with it. Um, you know, just from even just an everyday use for fans in the in, in the in the stadium or, or in the venue. Um, so, what do you need to kind of provide that experience to fans from an AR experience? I think that'll help to increase sort of like you know that engagement factor or that that what else fans can do at your events in the future. So th those are my couple of cents. Thank you, Justin. Uh, you really bring an interesting perspective and I appreciate your thoughts there. It's uh, it's funny because just as like words start slipping out that we're doing something in Florida for our own experience center, I had all these AI companies in VR and I mean, all these companies like, oh, I want to put some goggles in, in you know, your place. I'm like, I think we're good on the goggles, you know? Maybe give me a bottle of single malt for the sports bar. We could talk about it. But it, it, it's really funny when you think about it, that all these spaces, people are excited about esports. There's no question about it. And the more that, you know, collectively as an industry, we help educate people on what it really entails, what are things to consider about. And that's what we addressed here on the panel from high school to a collegiate level to a pro level. And uh, I really want to give a big thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, Jeff uh, from Alpha, thank you so much. Um, someone wants to reach you. I know it's not email. I think it was LinkedIn we agreed upon. Uh, people can reach me any way that they prefer, but yeah, LinkedIn is uh, <laughs> the best way to reach me. All right, thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, other Jeff from O Sports, thanks so much. And uh, I assume LinkedIn is the best way to reach you if someone wants to get you as well. Yeah, either, either with me or, or just O Sports at LinkedIn. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, Kevin, um, I know internet connectivity in some areas in the country are not always so good, uh, east versus west or Midwest. So uh, I want to thank you, obviously, for joining as well. And uh, thank you for being involved. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Adrian, um, one of my probably the most longstanding relationships of, uh, on this call, uh, different uniforms at times, but thank you so much for uh, joining us and uh, wish you a ton of luck at IBCI, obviously. Thanks. I prefer smoke signals, by the way. I'll be looking. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, and, um, you know, uh, Justin, thanks so much, not just being a partner of PrimeView on the esports side, but thanks so much for being involved in this panel. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, obviously your production team as well. You know, uh, we really appreciate them being involved. And uh, lastly, Brandon from AVISPL, one of our good partners from PrimeView over the years as well. Thanks so much for being involved. And people want to reach you. Uh, LinkedIn is a, is a nice way to get you in touch with you. Yeah. Yeah. LinkedIn's good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, all the panelists for being involved. I know this was a big, you know, clunk of your day in the middle of the day on a, on a weekend. So I'm sure everyone's missing happy hour to a certain extent. So uh, we'll cut it here. And I want to thank all the attendees, right? You make this really special. Uh, this is this is beyond monetization, I guess, at this point. This is about engagement as a whole. And I uh, thank you so much for everybody registering. For those of you that registered and did not have a chance to stay on throughout the ent entirety of the panel, there will be a recording that will be shared later. Um, you know, on behalf of PrimeView, thank you so much for being involved. And uh, looking forward to building and designing esports collectively with everyone here. Thank you. Have a happy and healthy weekend.